Uh, hi, it's Tom. Uh, we're reading from chapter 9 in the first book of my memoir series, Don't Call Me Jupiter. We just had a visit from our father who came out from the East Coast. <clears throat> we have other visitors that summer as well. Seeing Peggy's 21 window VW bus pull into our driveway is a welcome sight. John and Mom have been fighting again. They need a break from each other, and we're always from up for a break from John as well. Their visit quickly morphs into a camping trip on the coast. As Peggy and Mom tell John their plan, he's more tuned into the TV than he is to them. He doesn't like Peggy, or any of her kids for that matter, and he's glad we're all going away for the weekend. With every mile that separates us from John, the more relaxed we become. Peggy is a full-fledged hippie now, and encourages us to adopt her lifestyle to live with no boundaries, no hang-ups, no greed, no negativity, and no shame. I swear I didn't fart. That was a, a pond near me. We turned off the waterfall so we could hear my voice, but now it's farting. So I don't know which is worse, farting or my voice. <clears throat> Peggy is extremely convincing. When we reach Dylan's beach, we're feeling so free. We ditch our clothes, sprint naked across the sand into the cold Pacific breakers. I may be free, but I'm still self-conscious. As I'm getting out of the water, I can't help but notice how shriveled up my privates are. My penis is usually much bigger than this, I point out to everyone, making sure they understand. Same with my balls. Seriously, I don't know where they are. Danny is also searching for his balls and finds them missing as well. Maybe they'll wash up on shore, he says. He's right, so please, all of you, keep your eyes open for our balls. To warm up, Danny and I take turns burying each other in the sand. Chris and Claire look for seashells. Shelly and Laura disappear behind some rocks, probably to smoke cigarettes. Molly and Annalisa build sand castles. Alex wanders off to fall in love with a tide pool full of tiny creatures. Mom and Peggy build a fire and start a conversation that lasts for the next two days. The food we eat is nothing special, but it never tasted so good. After dinner, Mom and Peggy drink from a from drink wine from a Boda bag and smoke something called Wacko Tobacco, which is obviously marijuana. Peggy and Dan are now divorced, and Peggy is fiercely proud of it. She's strutting the benefits of being independent. The kids get along better with their dad ever since he moved out. I even get along better with the rat bastard now that we're divorced. Let's face it, sometimes divorce is the right thing to do, she says. I love working and having my own money. She looks directly at my mother. You should get your driver's license and find a job. I know the whole dead high school sweetheart will never drive again story. Get over it. You're not a teeny bopper anymore. How can you be independent without being able to get around? A job would get you out of the house a few days a week. That kind of space would be good for you. Some change would do you good. Mom nods in agreement, then drifts away in thought. You know what this means, Laura says. Your mother will be divorcing John soon. It's because of the cosmic connection she has with Peggy. She's right, you know, because John is a shit-faced asshole, Claire says with her oversized tongue and plenty of saliva. Logically, I know that just because theirs did doesn't mean ours will, but then again, our families do have a history of mirroring each other. None of us wants the trip to end. I dread the thought of returning home and having to deal with my parents' next fight. We say goodbye to our God family in the drive driveway and watch them disappear. As the sound of their VW fades away, I find myself wishing I was leaving with them. You don't realize you're growing up. You really can't tell you're changing because it happens in minute increments each day. Then every once in a while you glance back, step out of your skin, and see yourself and your family objectively and realize just how much everybody actually has changed. My little brother is getting older and harder to manipulate. He's mastered the fine art of fake crying and getting me into trouble. He knows how to push my buttons. He'll hold his finger impossibly close to one of my models and tell me that I can't get mad at him because he's at least one molecule away from touching it. This is when I remind him that I'm one molecule away from kicking his, his frickin' ass. Shelly is in the sixth grade. Suddenly she has breasts and is more interested in boys than anything else. I'm surprised that half the kids at her birthday party are boys. Chris is right behind her in the fifth grade and is also preoccupied with boys. We arrange a touching mock wedding in the neighborhood for Chris and a boy we call Tony Baloney. The next day, they cut school and hang out at the river for their honeymoon. Even though they get caught and punished, the school idolizes them for their uncontainable passion. 
Chris has a way of being popular without even trying, no matter what she does. So we're going to cut it off there. We'll pick up with more Chapter 9 on the next Page Turning Tuesdays with Tom. Thanks for all your support. Uh, out. Out.